Let's welcome to the stage my friend, your friend. We're going to sit down and talk. Mr. James Fox. James, come on up here. I want to stay on the phenomenon for a second. Yes. What was the encounter itself, and when did it happen? So it was 1955. He was taking the B-25 bomber from um, Alabama, I think, to, to Florida. And he was with a couple of engineers, one from Lockheed, I think the other one from Boeing. And uh, they were at 9,000 foot elevation, and they saw what appeared to be like a, like a glimmering reflection in the upper right hand corner of the of the cockpit window of, of like a little like a light or something and it, what is that you know and it streaked down across right in front of them at 9,000 foot of elevation and they realized this is this doesn't this is what what are we looking at and so he went to pursue this object it was a it was a disc shaped object and the disc was kind of playing with them, and it went from 9,000 feet right down to treetop level, and Colonel Coleman said, I was going at maximum continuous power at treetop level, and I said, what do you mean when you say maximum continuous power? He said, if I'd gone any faster, the engines would blow up. That was maximum continuous power. And we were at treetop level, and I thought I was going to collide with this disc. We were all just, you know, our jaws were on the floor. And, and, and for everybody to understand really quick, a B-25 Mitchell is a World War II era four-engine massive bomber. Yeah. So this is a big plane. This isn't a small plane. This is a massive uh, United States Air Force bomber. We rent this B-25 bomber. I'm in the nose cone. We've got cameras mounted everywhere. So, so they 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 thought they were going to collide with the disc, and they were at treetop level, and he was going to hit it, and he thought I'm going to collide with this disc. It was broad daylight, and so he said I I tried to I wanted to turn to avoid hitting it, but had I turned at the altitude that I was at, my right wing would have dipped and would have hit the trees. Moments later, they looked down, and this disc was going across a plowed field and it was stirring up dirt on either side of it. And the disc was just, you know, and they're looking at this thing and then, and then the next thing they knew it was, you know, as most uh, witnesses report, it just was, it was just gone. 10 years later, the Air Force put him as public spokesman for Project Blue Book. And they were all debriefed right after the incident because Project Blue Book was in full swing. Uh, everybody was individually interviewed. One of the aspects of the encounter that the, the investigators said that was remarkable was how exactly uh, accurate every one of their stories was identical with the others. They were all separated. And of course, once uh, Colonel Coleman became public spokesman for Project Blue Book, the first thing he said he did was he went to Project Blue Book files to find his encounter and it wasn't there. The better qualified the observer, the more compelling the, 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 the incident, the, the, the more compelling the eyewitness testimony, uh, the less likely that the general public is ever gonna hear about it. Have you had your own interference run from what you would term as a, a, men, a, a men in black situation? I was interviewing Frances Barwood, who was councilwoman in, in Phoenix, Arizona, and she was getting pressure from constituents to like, hey, we want answers, what was this object that flew over, yada, yada, yada. And uh, she said that uh, this is an ongoing thing that I was, I was uh, in touch with her about in the 90s. Well, this guy reached out to her and he said, you know, thank you for, for this. Um, I, I'm a Vietnam vet and I was, uh, I'm also, um, I'm interested in, 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 in the, it was the, uh, uh, there was a meteorite, the Hale-Bob Comet that happened to be flying over during that time and people were out under the night sky trying to get a glimpse of the Hellbob Comet. And this guy said I was, I had my camera on a tripod on the roof and I was gonna film the Hellbob Comet. And as a Vietnam vet, I have a CB radio and I'm listening to the truckers uh, on Interstate 10 between Tucson and Phoenix. And I hear them talking about this massive boomerang shaped craft on the CB radios. And I thought to myself, well, gosh, this object seems to be going from 
the south to uh, or from the north to the south and, and and I'm right here and and you know and he got ready and as and luck would have it the the boomerang shaped massive object that was up to a mile or two across flew right over his house and he had his camera on a tripod and he filmed it and he said look would you be interested to Francis Barwood would you be interested in, in this footage she said my of course that would be great he said these two men showed up in a government looking vehicle in dark suits he said they were quite menacing and they said uh and they said we're from Francis Barwood's office we're here to pick up the footage and uh, he said oh well she didn't tell me she was sending people over and he goes to be quite honest with you I was relieved that that's what they wanted because they were quite menacing and and uh I was and, and I you know did they ask any questions and he said well the only question they asked is did you make copies and he said no I did not and he gave them the footage and off they went so he calls her up he said well what did you think she said, what do you mean? You were going to come and drop the footage off. He said, well, I didn't need to because two men from your office showed up and gave me the footage. And I gave them the footage. And she said, I didn't send anybody to, you know, pick up the footage. Then when I was in Brazil and I was interviewing the mother of the two daughters, the girls that came within eight feet of this live creature, being ET, entity, whatever you want to call it, uh, started talking about these men in suits that showed up at her house, very intimidating and, and, and threatening, not like, not overt threats, like we're going to kill you if you talk about this, but just menacing. And they offered her a briefcase full of money, get their daughters to do some press, uh, some, some press, some statements in the press to say that they lied. They didn't actually see that. It was actually something else and that they're sorry and this whole thing could end and they're, they could live happily ever after. And I thought to myself, okay, I, I, I believe in these men in black now. When you go, the, the one case for me, what, what, what is that case? I started looking into Socorro, New Mexico. It was the case that changed everything. That's right. There was so much physical evidence on the ground. Well, I found this document that had the, there was so much, uh, speculation and conjecture for 50 years over the symbol on the on the craft right and the symbol on the craft was stated by the United States Air Force with the cooperation of Lana Zamora was something different than what was initially stated when it happened uh, on the day of the encounter and the real signal uh, sorry the real symbol was an upside down V it's like like this, it had a line here, line here, and a line here, like this. But there was no documentation that that was the case. But that's that's what was reported the day of. Now, there was a guy named Richard Holder from uh, White Sands. He was the first military officer on the scene within an hour of the, of the incident. Did, and, did it surprise you that that day, in such a short time, that we had the local police, we had the state highway patrol, the Air Force, and the FBI yeah. all there at the same time. And also kind of saying, this is what you really saw. Richard Holder said, let's just tell the public that the symbol you saw was something entirely different. Therefore, we could quickly identify, and I thought there was some justification to this, we could quickly identify a hoaxer who says, yeah, I saw the same object, what did the symbol look like? Yeah, that's what the symbol looked like. And they could quickly eliminate, you know, the credibility of this individual. Sounds because, legit. Yeah, it sounded legit. Sound so legit. That's, I was like, okay, I could agree with that. Now, the other thing that the Air Force, and this is his wife, his daughter, and his co-workers, that the Air Force adamantly wanted him to downplay or not talk about at all, was the contact with the creatures, the beings, the ETs, whatever the hell you want to call them, they were on the ground milling about at the bottom of this egg-shaped craft. And his wife said to me, my husband was never the same after he saw what he saw. And her husband, Lonnie Zamora, made eye contact with one of these beings. James Fox, everybody.